Balja Awalia, my friends. Welcome back to our channel. Today, we're going to look into the weird case of the Kunin Portergeist in County Fermanagh. But before we begin, I would like to ask you all to hit that subscribe button if you are new. Every like and comment helps our channel grow, and we're well on our way to our 1000 subscriber goal. So without any further delay, let's delve into the story of the Kunin Portergeist. Hidden in a dark, dank forest near Clover in County Fermanagh, this abandoned cottage was the scene of a well-documented portergeist manifestation. The occupants of the cottage, along with their belongings, have long since disappeared. The grim structure, however, still remains, much as it was during this violent and demonic haunting. The property had passed from the Burnside family to the Corrigans and then to the Sherry family, who occupied the cottage for only one night, selling the cottage to the Murphy family six months later. The widow, Mrs. Bridget Murphy, born in 1870, lived in the cottage with her son James and her six daughters, Annie, Mary, Teresa, Bridget, Catherine and Jane. However, trouble started in the autumn of 1914. One gloomy, cold and wet evening, Mrs. Murphy was sitting by the fire with her daughter Annie. Suddenly, they heard mysterious footsteps coming from the ceiling, then loud tapping on the wall behind them. The three youngest girls who were in the adjoining room began screaming in terror. In the following days, the cottage became infested with a poltergeist, whose activity manifested itself with ever increasing vigour. Robert U. Benson, a priest who had converted from the Church of England to the Catholic faith and who had written extensively on life after death, promised to visit and investigate the cottage. Unfortunately, he died on October 19, 1914, before he was able to reach the Murphys. Two other priests, Father Peter Smith and Father Eugene Coyle, offered to support the family and both witnessed shocking and unexplained events. These were reported to the Bishop of Clogher, Patrick McKenna, who decided that the events were diabolical in origin, and he assigned Dean Keown to perform an exorcism. Dean Keown, however, for some unknown reason, withdrew from the case, and the exorcism was never carried out. Father Smith and Father Coyle investigated the manifestations more than 50 times. The poltergeist apparently came down through the rooms with a sweeping sound like straw in the air. On one occasion a sheet was laid out on an empty bed where the young Murphy girl slept. Soon a human form was seen to bubble up under the sheet and then raise itself into a terrifying animal shape before suddenly collapsing. The surroundings of the room were thoroughly checked and no possible cause for this bizarre and horrifying activity could be found. When sitting on the bed, the priest described a feeling like snakes moving under them. A snoring sound was heard coming from the dark areas of the room, followed by spitting and then hissing. When the children returned to bed, there were sounds like a kicking horse and then suddenly the bedclothes were thrown across the room. One priest stood with his hand on the bed and challenged the poltergeist. He described the feeling of a rat moving around his hand under the sheet, followed by the shocking sensation of an eel twisting around his wrist, but no further, not daring to touch his consecrated hand. Another priest visited the college about 16 times to investigate the frightening phenomena and offer comfort to the Murphy family. He recorded that a whistling music was often heard coming from the ceiling, followed by loud raps and taps. When he asked for nine raps in succession, they quickly came. Questions were asked in English, Latin and Irish, and all were answered correctly. 
A question was asked, how many people in the room were born in County Monaghan? The correct answer came in a series of raps. The priest was convinced of the ghost being alive and intelligent, but also tricky and contradictory. On one occasion, holy water was used copiously, causing the portuguese to flee along the wall with furious knocking and banging. After the activity had continued for several weeks, it was suggested that the strange events were perhaps some kind of hoax carried out by the Murphy children. To test this theory, one evening a group of nine or ten people assembled in the cottage. The knocking, banging and hissing were so violent that not one person in the room believed the children were capable of making all these noises. Just to be sure, a number of men placed their arms over the children's hands and feet. The knocking continued for a further 10 minutes and then suddenly all the men ran out terrified from the room, saying that they had been pushed and punched by some force that had emerged from the darkness. Another priest described further extraordinary activity. He was standing in the centre of a room accompanied by James Murphy. It was the dead of night and the room was illuminated only by a few candles. Suddenly, a tramping sound was heard running across the ceiling. The roof space above was empty and could only be accessed by an outside staircase. Both the priest and James took it in turns to investigate the roof. The tramping sounds continued and grew louder even though the roof space was proved to be vacant. When both men again stood still at the centre of the room, something rushed them, pushed them, and then disappeared into the earth. They were both terrified. As day broke, the blinds were opened, allowing the dawn light to illuminate the room. Now they noticed that a bed sheet was moving and gradually forming a defined shape of a young person lying diagonally underneath it. Soon they heard the ghastly sounds of heavy, struggled breathing and a gurgling of the throat. The shape began to writhe as if in a death agony. The scene was observed for about 10 minutes before the room, again, became silent. Mrs. Murphy later told one of the priests that it was her daughter Annie who was affected and that it appeared that the manifestations were centred around her. A series of tests were carried out with Mrs. Murphy and Annie taking it in turns to lie down across the bed. Whenever Annie lay down, a rushing sound was heard passing from the ceiling, down the wall and into the bed. When Mrs. Murphy took her turn lying on the bed, no such manifestations appeared. One evening, when the noises were more violent than ever, a priest who was returning from a sick call and carrying the Eucharist made the sign of a cross over the bed. The noises heard were described as unimaginable and all the people in the room threw themselves on the floor thinking they were about to be attacked. No exorcism was ever carried out and the Murphy family eventually sought refuge by emigrating to America. After their departure, no further appearance of the Portergeist was ever recorded. All the priests who investigated the case all suffered badly from their interactions with the Portergeist. One priest had a nervous breakdown, another developed spinal meningitis and then a third facial paralysis. As with all cases of portergeist activity, it seems to be centred around teens going through puberty, as any would have been at the time. Or was it a case of demonic possession, with Annie being the victim of some sort of demon? We may never know. So what do you guys think? Let us know in the comments. 
And once again, thank you all so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed today's video. I will see you real soon in the next one. But for now, good night and good luck. Thank <laughs> you.